oh, I can see all the um, numbers starting to ping in. Welcome everybody to this um, uh, IMCO, Maternity Natural Health um, little webinar today. And I'm so thrilled today to be able to bring to you Irene Chain Kalinowski and uh, have a wave, Irene. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. Greetings from Christchurch. <laughs> yes. So uh, Irene at the moment is uh, in the compulsory two-week quarantine on arrival in New Zealand. So COVID is, a, is certainly making a whole different world for us these days. That's for sure. Um, and look, I'm so super excited about... Um, introducing you all to uh, Irene today. And uh, I'm always excited about our guests, but this one is a little bit close to my heart because a couple of years ago, um, I was uh, very thrilled to be um, invited over to where Irene has been for the last, nearly last five years in China. And I spoke at a conference there and Irene and I have um, known each other a while now. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about um, some of the, uh, what she's found going through some of her research and um, the challenges that she's faced because she's actually been hands-on in the trenches, um, integrating um, a holistic care with medical care, which she's going to talk to you about. Um, and, uh, but while we're just waiting for, the, for some more people to be signing in, um, I thought I'd tell you a couple of um, stories a little close to my heart. So when I was um, uh, in China with uh, our lovely Irene, um, there was a uh, wonderful uh, a Brazil, Brazilian um, obstetrician there called Edson Souza, and uh, he's a senior obstetrician at the Sophia Feldman Hospital in Brazil. And I don't know if everyone realizes it, but Brazil has a c-section rate of around sort of 70 to 85 percent with their private obstetricians and uh, here he is a very very um, holistic normal birth obstetrician and I, I said to him um, you know how do the other obstetricians take you and you know locally and he's like they hate me I'm the black sheep <laughs> And that, that certainly made uh, Irene and I laugh because uh, I think we've both felt that way sometimes. And, um, you know, I, I have a, um, a dedication in a, uh, a book I've just written where I've um, actually said that I dedicate the book to the forthright, rebellious, non-conforming, revolutionary, dissident mavericks <laughs> on this planet. <laughs> And I think that we sort of have to put ourselves in those categories sometimes. And you know, uh, when you conform, nothing changes. And when you don't conform, that's when you create change. Um, and uh, the other little funny little story I'll just tell you. Now, also, once you're all signing in, please do go into the chat area and let us know where you are in the world and your role. So if you're a health professional, please let us know. Um, it's good for us to know the audience, or if you're a mama to be expecting a baby, we'd love to know that too. So go into the chat, it's at the bottom of the screen and let us know. And, um, and the other gorgeous thing that occurred, um, well, there were lots of things, gorgeous things that occurred in China, but another one, one that did certainly made us giggle. I don't know if you remember this, um, Irene, but we were sitting at dinner one night after the conference, just you and I, and you got this email through from um, Alistair Gray from New York, who um, is your associate at the Academy of Homeopathy Education in New York. And, and he was like, hey, have you heard about this conference going on in New Zealand for IMCO? Are you going to go? And you were like, yes, I'm going to go. In fact, the conference organizer is sitting at the table with me right now in China. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a, um, a very small world. And uh, so welcome, welcome. So let's just um, get going on all of this. So just a, a little reintroduction of um, Irene. Irene is a New Zealand, UK uh, registered nurse midwife and a, a very experienced, skilled homeopathic midwife. Um, she's also an author and an international lecturer, um, and she's got about 40 years experience, clinical experience with midwifery in the UK, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, New Zealand, China, um, 
And uh, so welcome, welcome, Irene. It's great to be here with you all, and I'm so excited to be here. And thank you, Kathy, for inviting me. Uh, this is my passion. You know that my passion has always been integrated care. Started a long time ago when I was uh, a midwife, and there were women with postpartum depression. They stayed in hospital for ten days then, and I kept saying, "There's got to be a way. There's a better way." And yeah, yeah I found now, it. <laughs> the, the, we're just so thrilled you're here. Um, the format today is that uh, we're just going to go over a little bit of sort of introductory information overview, and then Irene's got a fantastic PowerPoint. Um, to show you all and um, that we can share with you and she'll also talk about some of her literature that you'll be able to get hold of as well. Um, so just a quick sort of um, introduction, do you want to just explain um, you know how you ended up in China and because uh, you've been there for nearly five years and uh, what you've been doing there, tell us a little bit about the MMSE system and, and your um, My Body, My Baby project. Right. Well, I want to be try and be pretty quick because I can I can spend a lifetime telling you about this. Yes. Um, I started off in New Zealand 20 years ago. I studied homeopathy and integrated it with my midwifery practice. Uh, and I was getting really good outcomes. You know, 95% normal births by the time I left. Uh, did I think I only saw one case of depression. Um, in all that time, and that's more than a thousand women. So what happened was, is that I found that I was doing a lot for my community in New Zealand, but there was a whole world out there. And because our Western system in New Zealand was still not open <laughs> enough for integrated care, uh, Jenny called me and it was a decision that I I couldn't refuse because it, I knew I was going to be with Chinese traditional hospitals and working with people with a much more open mind. So that's how I ended up in China. Yeah, just yeah. amazing. And, and the, the thing is that China is integrating its maternity health care. It's happening. Um, and you, you'll explain more about that. And, I mean, it is that idea that um, the more of our obstetricians and, and midwives often already are, but particularly our um, obstetric colleagues um, is, are really needing to adopt that homeopathic, holistic, um, medical herbalism kind of mindset as well, because we just know it makes so much difference. Um, you say that prevention is missing from a, a large part of maternity care. Um, do you want to explain that now sort of how that um yeah. how that integrated approach or do you want to you might want to put that into your powerpoint no i i can think i can put that in now because yeah. i think it's really important i've been very privileged in china because i've traveled the whole of china maybe 20 different hospitals uh doing kind of audits and sitting in in uh obstetric clinics so i'm listening to obstetricians giving advice, nurses giving advice, midwives, pediatricians giving advice. And I realized that they couldn't fix the simple problems. They couldn't even fix themselves. <laughs> and that's the worry, yeah. So when I came out, I realized, yes, we're very good at doing blood tests and investigations, and we're really good at managing hypertension. But what about preventing it? <laughs> you know, <Yes. laughs> you know, and I've had many, Absolutely. many lecturers from all around the world, great obstetricians, great midwives, and we come with very theoretical knowledge about how to manage something, but we don't talk about preventing it. You know, yeah. it's the same with perineal massage, you know, we, everybody should have perineal massage, but what if the woman hasn't got a healthy perineum? What if her diet's not right? Yes. You know, what if she's had abuse or something like that? And we're all going around saying, no, perineal massage is great. What damage are we doing to women? And, and none of the research papers looked at, at diet or the woman's uh, social background. There's nothing like that. We're just focusing on massage and a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so, Absolutely. Okay, well, let me just have a little look what who we've got 
um, oh, look, we've got some people from all over the place. Fantastic. Um, we've got homeopath here, acupuncturist, midwives, etc. I noticed that um, Naima, uh, you've given us a couple of questions already through, which is lovely, except they're not in English. <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't mind um, putting your questions through to us in English, that would be awesome. Um, and then um, we'll be able to answer those. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so look, I'm going to leave you to it now, Irene, and just sort of contribute in there every so often um, and when there's some questions coming through. So do you want to just go and share your screen and um, sure. take over? Because I know you have got wonderful okay. stuff together. Okay. And do let us know where you're from and um, your role, everybody. Put it up on chat. That'd be great. Okay. And if you've got any questions, do just stick that through into the Q&A section. Um, and those buttons are down the bottom of the screen. So I, I'll hand you over. <laughs> okay. So we can't, uh, I can't give you the whole uh, prenatal uh, preventative care because there's 950 pages in my book. But I want to give you, highlight some of the things in our medical practice that we really need to review and look at. And look at it with a, the Chinese medicine, homeopathy, Ayurvedic medicine, because we all take into consideration the mind-body connection and the external environment that can affect the problems. So I'm going to go over uh, the first part and the first bit I took Hippocrates here is let food be thy medicine and medicine be their food. And it's the number one thing in Chinese medicine, homeopathy, um, Ayurvedic medicine is that food is the medicine, but we need to understand the pathophysiology and we need to know what's in the food <laughs> so we can actually support everyone, but it's not only food. Yes, because the environment and stress can interfere with the entire digestive system. Just trying to get the next one down where it doesn't seem to be moving. I'm, I'm free stuck. Uh, Kathy, I'm going to have to come out of this a minute. I'm, my, my, free, okay. my, my, my screen's for, oh, that's it. Okay, I've got it. Oh, got there it. we go. Oh, it's okay. probably because you're live, it's maybe just making everything a little bit slower. Probably, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things we need to look at is I, I, I decided to take iron and, and hemoglobin levels and ferritin levels, yeah? And what I found is that dietary factors influence iron absorption, yeah, uh, to increase its uptake. But there's also uh, phylate, phytates that can actually decrease its uptake. So instead of just prescribing an iron tablet for someone, we should be looking at, well, what is she eating? Because if she's eating lots of wheat and breakfast cereals and drinking lots of teas, there's no point in prescribing a, uh, iron medications. And also, if you look uh, below on the iron inhibitors, inhibitors, we've got phytates, tannin, soil clay, starch, too much iron. So we can actually create a problem if we're giving too much iron. And also we've got competitors. So if we have too much iron, it can reduce the magnesium and zinc, all which are related to diabetes and high blood pressure. So by giving one thing, we can actually interfere with the other. And this is why it's so important that we understand nutrition and the pathophysiology. Yeah, so there's no point in giving somebody some iron pills and say, well, squeeze some lemon juice on your, on your salad to absorb the iron because stress indicators, environmental toxins, they all interfere with the iron absorption. So, and also uh, 
low uh, zinc, magnesium, yeah, it's linked to, I've said hypertension and preeclampsia, but it's also linked to low nitric oxide. And this is another part I'm going to come to because many of you might not know what nitric oxide is. It's a breakdown of nitrates. So I will come on to that very shortly. The other part is zinc and magnesium, you need it for healthy skin and muscle. So if we're depleting those stores, you can look at someone and maybe she's got stretch marks. Well, there's no point in telling a woman who's getting these stretch marks just to put some cream onto them because it's telling us that her, um, her collagen and her skin elasticity is not very good. So what does that indicate for labor and birth? It's going to mean that, well, zinc and magnesium you need for contractions. Uh, zinc works on the neurotransmitters. Uh, if you don't have good muscles, which you need protein for, of course, you're not going to get contractions. And probably the woman may hemorrhage. So we need to look beyond the iron and the hemoglobin. We need to look at the entire picture of the woman. And please, uh, on your chat, you can tap your questions and we'll answer them shortly. Okay. So if we look at the causes of um, anemia, yes, I've got the big list here. I think you can see them. Iron deficiency, B9, which is folate, B12, vitamin A, malnutrition, obesity, chronic disease, inflammation. And inflammation also comes from environmental stress factors. Yeah, there's hookworm parasitic disease. And I found in China that in the, the South province near Vietnam, women were more prone to anemia because it's a very malarial environment. And of course, we've got HIV, AIDS and genetic disorders. So, and if we look at obesity, well, Hepcidin is a peptide hormone and it's responsible for iron homeostasis. Yes, and it's always elevated in the, in the presence of inflammation. So any kind of inflammation that comes from it, its poor diet, its insulin resistance, it's eating the carbohydrates, it's eating the, the, the saturated foods. So we need to look at all of this because if we don't, then women are at risk for postpartum hemorrhage and high nitric oxide levels. So, and, and also you'll find that hemoglobin levels are in the normal range for obese women. So does that tell us she's healthy? We really need to look at the big picture. Okay. So we've got many debates about iron. Yeah, the benefits of preventative iron or regular administration. Uh, the, we don't have actual knowledge of the iron stores or the physiology of iron, yeah? Uh, the possible harmful effects of non-selective iron uh, administration. And if you look at the, the bottom paragraph here, you know, here's a question that I put together for you all to think about. And that is, does unnecessary iron administration to a healthy woman interfere with the natural hemodilution at the end of pregnancy? Increased blood volume and does it in fact contribute to postpartum hemorrhage? So you researchers out there, I'm hoping that for your PhDs or whatever you want to do, you need to answer these questions and look more deeply into it. Now I'm by no means a scientist, I'm just picking out uh, the, the implications from my homeopathic mindset and my midwifery knowledge and experience. So we need to look at what is high nitric oxide, yeah? Um, well, if we have high nitric oxide levels, nitric oxide is important for the vascular constriction of blood vessels. So women with eclampsia have low nitric oxide levels. Uh, women uh, or hemorrhage have higher ones, yeah? So we need to look at, um, we need to look at the big picture, yeah? So we cannot only focus on the anemia or iron deficiency 
but we have to get to the root cause because otherwise we can create problems. So when Chinese medicine believes when it comes to anemia that um, the body's producing insufficient quality, quantities of blood of good quality or that the flow of the chi or the essential vital spirit that keeps the body health is become blocked and reduced so they have very uh, different techniques to stimulate the organs and produce better quality of blood is that not as good as giving iron some women will eat a healthy diet and you'll be saying but your iron counts low so you can't can't be eating the right things yeah and then this has a psychological effect on the woman when she is but there's probably environmental stresses that's preventing all this happening so this is where we need um we need things like uh meditation yoga self-coping techniques counselors for relationships i mean my midwifery takes me that far okay so like homeopathy the specific chinese medicine treatments used depends on the individualized symptoms presented by the woman so in, in western medicine we look at a symptom and we'll give a medicine for it to fix the symptom but the symptoms the collection of external influences as well as the mind-body connection and the pathophysiology of what's going off with the woman. And every woman has a different constitution. And I would like to see that they found it in, in China, they did research and they found that 50% of women had poor um, constitutions, poor health according to uh, Chinese medicine, whereas in our medical approach, we deem them as being healthy. So yes, different constitutions need unique treatments, different foods due to different food properties, and an importance of cooking food. Uh, you know, the way food is cooked has plays a huge part, and I don't think any uh, maybe Ayurveda does, but I've not studied it, but Chinese medicine plays a huge important role in, in nutrition and it puts all these things together and it mixes the food combinations, yeah? So we also need to give guidance on their work, women managing stress, rest and exercise regimes, and the use of different Chinese herbs, homeopathy, Ayurvedic medicine to prevent all these problems and I truly believe and I've seen it that many of these pregnancy complications can be prevented with integrated approaches to care and here's a little example of um, in China where they use a, a siltworm to treat anemia yes so in a multi-center location in China with adults you know they did it on pregnant women 13 plus gestation to late pregnancy and children aged 6 to 14 years with iron deficiency anemia they found that hemoglobin concentration significantly increased and the iron metabolism improved by giving the siltworm treatment for four weeks and the efficacy rates in ordinary adults late gestation women and children range and post-operative patients read from 79 to 9, uh, 80% to 90, nearly 92%. So we have to say that care is no longer only Western medicine. Yeah, it's an integrated model of care that's both a science and an art. And if we can get such rapid, uh, quick recovery, especially in the postpartum period, surely we should be looking where women have had a lot of blood loss surely we should be looking at integrating care and i've seen uh, the the chinese herbs given and how women many women in china have have a speedier postpartum recovery we have acupuncture yes because acupuncture uh, can invigorates 
and, and tonifies the blood and, and treat all forms of disorders. Um, there's the liver eight, which acts on the liver meridian um, and the stomach 36, yes, which tonifies both energy and ki. But it's not only, Chinese medicine do not only use acupuncture, they give dietary advice. Yes, it's the entire concept. And when they take the pools and they take the, um, the complete picture of the person through observation, they can even identify where the emotional blockages are. So it's quite amazing. And for me, it was incredible to see it. And of course, massage is very important in Chinese medicine. Women on postpartum wards are given a Chinese massage to help recovery. So now I'm going to come on to nitric oxide. Yes, it's important in the physi physiology of the reproductive system and something is recent research, but quite not so recent. And it's something that I believe all midwives and, and health professionals should understand because it's part of a real pathophysiology in the prevention of hemorrhage and uh, intrauterine growth restriction, hypertensive disorders, yeah? So we really uh, need to focus on how we can keep these nitric oxide levels balanced. And you're going to see that there's a total diverse interconnection of different symptoms and organs. Uh, and external effects that can affect nitric oxide production. So nitric oxide is a central molecule involved in several physiological and pathological processes with all mammalian bodies. Yes, relaxin and progesterone both recently uh, release nitric oxide and it's important for uh, blood flow. So abnormal nitric oxide production occurs in different disease situations. So we need to look at, are we only focusing on hypertension? You know, some of the latest research is saying we're going to need to give nitrate medications, nitric oxide, uh, to help with hypertension. But there's another side to it. And if we start focusing just on giving one medication or one part of nitric oxide, we can actually create problems. So we need to understand the root problem and get to where we are, um, what we're dealing with. Um, vascular actions of nitric oxide can prevent sympathetic vasoconstriction, but they can also cause constriction. And we're going to go on about that. So we've got nature's beautiful, isn't it? The, the physiology is there to protect the woman. So serum nitric oxide concentrations in healthy pregnant women are higher during the second and third trimester of pregnancy. So on one side, we've got the woman producing uh, fibrinogen to help the blood clot. But on the other side, we've got um, the nitric oxide in higher uh, doses because it's it, 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 it causes vasodilation so there's a better flow between mother and fetus. So it's really important for placental activity. Yeah. And what we need to do is look at preeclampsia has a reduction of nitric oxide. So my curiosity says to me, why? Why do we have too much? Why do we have too little? What is it in the birth environment even? How does our birth environment affect nitric oxide? Well, it's simple because nitric oxide is also important in uh, producing birthing hormones, for example. So if our environments are not supporting the, the birthing hormone production and we're creating stress, we are reducing uh, the, the levels of um, nitric oxide. So the root causes 
are saturated fats, obesity, high sugar intake, env environmental and psychological stress factors all interfere with the production. So we're going to get hypertension. Uh, you can see why diabetes is linked to this because the high sugar intake create, reduces nitric oxide which then constricts the blood vessels. So you can see why they're interrelated. And I think we need to know this and we also need to explain and teach the physiology to, to women themselves. So they understand their body and they will pay more attention to their diet and how they take care of themselves. So what does it do? It, nitric oxide acts as an anti-inflammatory agent agent, it's antithrombotic, prevents muscle hyperplasia. When it's hampered, it can lead to hypertension, thrombosis, hemorrhage, vascular hypertrophy and stenosis, and excess inflammation. And if you think of excess inflammation, you're also going to think about, what about mastitis? What about wound infections? What happens to the woman postpartum? Yeah. And like I say, the, 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 the medical research is only looking at giving nitric oxide as a, as a medication to treat hypertension. But we need all these different uh, holistic approaches to actually realize that it's not just hypertension. We need to treat the deficiency. Yes. Yeah. We need to not only treat the deficiency, but we need to treat the root cause. Where is it coming from? How many times do we take a history of a woman and we put us immediately at high risk? She's had uh, four or five miscarriages. Yeah. Or ectopic pregnancy. Well, when I was doing this research, I found that nitric oxide has been proposed as a physiological agent involved in the mechanism as it regulates the fetal placental vascular permeability and resistance. Yeah. And platelet aggregation in the placenta. And if that's disturbed with, it's going to create miscarriage. Yeah. It's also important for maturation development of the placenta. So when I look here, um, I'm sorry, but our videos are a little bit on the screen, but underneath it, in previous abortion yeah, and recurrent miscarriage, there's vasoconstriction. And in ectopic pregnancy, nitric oxide, there's vasodilation because it's actually relaxing the tubes and, and preventing the mortality, which is something so different to what I was thinking of where, oh, it's ectopic pregnancy, the tubes are blocked up or they're all constricted, but it's not the case. So too much or too little nitric oxide, can we give lifestyle and dietary advice and use integrated practices to prevent the reoccurrence of miscarriage? Women deserve much more. In a holistic way, you would look at women who've had a lot of miscarriage, we would say, what is it with your body? What is this about your life or your mindset that you're not able to carry these babies? How can we help you? And this what is what is needed to come into our, our clinics and in, in, into our maternity care. Okay. So how can we increase it? Well, I did a little bit of research because I thought, well, okay, if, if you don't have enough nitric oxide, uh, you're going to get high blood pressure. So what kind of foods will help this? And I was amazed to see that beetroot juice is high in dietary nitrates and it can enhance exercise performance, reduce long-term blood pressure and prevent respiratory infections. So even flu in pregnancy, if we can prevent the respiratory infections, do we need to mass immunize ourselves? I'm not sure, that's a debatable one, but it's just my questioning. 
though the ingestion of beetroot juice leads to an increase in bioavailability of nitrous oxide and beetroot juice consumption can reduce systolic blood pressure in just three hours. So we need more research and to work with integrated team of experts so we can't just have obstetrics separated from nutrition or herbalists. We, we all need to come together and but it also needs, um, I'm going to say a midwifery and a homeopathic mindset to bring it all together and to prevent these complications. If we have women with high blood pressure in our medical system, we can give medications. But what advice do we give them or what measures do we give to help their body get back on track? This is the prevention that I found is missing in, in hospitals all around the world. So dietary factors can potentially modulate, uh, modulate nitric oxide and the implications of disturbed nitric oxide production in diseases are various and depend on whether there's lack of exercise or excess nitric oxide production and they can modulate uh, so dietary factors can modulate it, dietary and lifestyle measures. So we just don't need to say women, oh, you need to exercise 20 minutes a day. We need to ask them, what are they eating for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and tea? If they've got excess stress, we know stress uh, releases adrenaline and you can get diabetes even if you eat a healthy diet. So we need to, again, we need to offer women dietary advice at every prenatal visit and alongside natural coping methods to eliminate stress. Where we can do meditation, we can do yoga, we can do homeopathy, we can do aromatherapy, um, uh, massage. And if we offer these things to women, is it not their choice? Should women not have a choice as to which route they want to take? For me, it's like, you know, I work in a multicultural environment. I did in New Zealand where I cared for maybe 30 different ethnic groups. So why can't my women from India have Ayurvedic medicine or homeopathy? Why can't Chinese population have Chinese medicine as part of that care? Why can't women who are only subject to our Western medicine also have choices because many of those women are now going to websites and they're becoming more interested in, in natural approaches to care, which have less spin-off effect. So let's have a look here. I'm just going to remind you that iron, actually iron availability modulates nitric oxide and um, Iron containing heme is an essential co component of uh, nitric oxide synthesis. Yes, iron deficiency reduces uh, nitric oxide, but too much iron can increase it. And I also found out that in the last part trimesters of pregnancy, if you go to the Chinese hospitals that have obstetrics and that run alongside Chinese traditional medicine hospitals, they actually advise their pregnant women not to eat meat at the end of pregnancy, to eat lots of fish, have lots of fish soup, you know, and if they're going to have soups, they can have some bone soups, but avoid the animal fats or, or, or avoid pushing too much iron into the body at the end of pregnancy. Protein. Well, we need a balance because low protein intake gives decreased nitric oxide production. So therefore, if women are not eating enough protein in their diet, they're going to be at risk of getting hypertension and, um, and the other problems that come with it. Okay, so it can lead to hypertension, a compromised immune system, but too much protein can also increase nitric oxide. And therefore, if we're telling women to have high protein diets without a balance of the carbohydrates, for example, or 
too much animal protein, are we not putting women at risk for hemorrhage? It's just my questions, but it's for you guys to go away and think about. Glucose, okay. So how old, yes, and, and nitric oxide production is dependent on glucose, yes. But too much of it, yes, too much of it will inhibit its production. And that's why diabetes is linked to hypertension, yes, and preeclampsia. It all makes sense when you look at it like this, okay. So we need to ask women every day when they come to visits, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and tea? We need to fix lifestyle and diet before, alongside any holistic measures that we offer. So homeopathy, just one little magic potion, is not going to fix the problem alone. Acupuncture alone is not going to fix it. Moxibustion is not going to fix it alone without fixing the external issue. I see women go for moxibustion uh, for breech birds and it works, they say it works 80% of the time, but unless you change the diet, unless you change the lifestyle, unless you address the woman's positions, the moxibustion is, is, is most likely to fail. That's why we all need to work together as an integrated team. Saturated fats. Well, I've already said that the saturated fats actually uh, uh, decrease uh, nitric oxide um, production. And, um, and women, pregnant women need a higher amount in the second and third trimester. So in China, pregnant women are advised not to consume animal meat in the last trimester of pregnancy, but to eat plenty of fish and vegetables. And on the other hand, if we think that we're going to give fish oil capsules as a supplement without looking at the big picture, the fish oil capsules increase nitric oxide. So if we give them too much fish oil, are we going to create hemorrhage? I need you all to think about that. And if you people out there are doing your research, please feel free and, and give us some feedback on, on what you've learned today. Vitamins, okay, so C, A, E, and folic acid, yeah, act as anti uh, sclerotic agents, yeah, and improve the endothelium dependent relaxation. So, A and E increases nitric oxide production in neuronal cells. So, does too much create hemorrhage, <laughs> and does too little <laughs> create hypertension? So, what are we looking at here? Okay, so vitamin K, yeah, inhibit uh, nitrous oxide production. So why does vitamin K stop hemorrhage? It probably constricts the blood vessels too, yeah? So if we're giving vitamin K, and I know it's a very touchy subject, yeah, but if you go into a lot of the research sites, uh, I think about strokes in newborn, we're finding that lots of newborn infants and children are having high blood pressure. Are we creating it? What's behind it? They're your questions to answer. It's just what I found during my research. Okay. Environment and stress affects the production of dopamine, serotonin and epinephrine, which is in turn has an effect upon nitric oxide production. So if we don't have um, relaxed birth centers, hospitals that pride a homely environment and a stress-free environment, are we creating either high blood pressures with too much adrenaline? Yeah, or are we creating hemorrhage just because we're not providing uh, care that actually takes on the emotional and psychological state of the woman. So please remember everything is a separate entity. We must look at the environment, diary intake, mind and body connection, and the psychological and emotional coping mechanisms of women. 
Okay, we're going to look at calcium. How many times do we give calcium to prevent hypertension? But if we give too much, it attenuates the development of hypertension yeah, in, in a rat. So we need to not just think calcium for high blood pressure and keep popping pills to women. We need to look at the diet and the entire picture. And again, zinc, yes. High levels of zinc are inhibited with uh, nitric oxide uh, with too much zinc, yeah, because it plays a role in modulating the vascular, immunological and intestinal function. So again, too much or too little. What is it about this woman? What is it in her diet? And the best attitude for us all to give is to understand the how uh, zinc, magnesium, minerals all have a long-term effect on, on the woman and can bring, if, if not given uh, uh, with sense and sensibility and looking at the big picture, we can create problems. Okay, and magnesium, we know that we give uh, magnesium uh, to women with uh, hypertension or preeclampsia. But if there's a magnesium deficiency in the pregnancy, would it not be better to ensure that these women are getting the correct nutrients? And also, if they have stress, you know, they can pop these pills, but they just might not be able to absorb them. So we need acupuncture, we need acupressure, we need homeopathy, we, we need a total integrated input so that she can actually absorb the food she's eating. Glucosamine, you know, I was talking before about stretch marks. Well, uh, glucosamine inhibits nitric oxide, but the thing is with glucosamine, what I found in the research is that you really have to, you make it in your body, yeah? And yes, it can uh, have implications for endothelial insulin resistance and cardiovascular comp complications such as uh, Again, hypertension, constricting the vessels. But bone broth soups <laughs> sustain healthy collagen. They encourage the body to make the glucosamine. Yeah? And if we're looking at stretch marks, you're thinking, well, if the woman's got these stretch marks, what's the matter with her collagen? What's the matter with her skin elasticity? What's happening here? And this is a point where it can trigger the midwife to ask, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner and tea? What's going on in your world? You know, take some bone broth soups, <laughs> yeah? Get a little bit more protein, zinc and magnesium in your diet. If you've got a lot of stress, we need to eliminate it. So safety needs an acquired knowledge of pathophysiology applied with a holistic integrated approach to care. So thank you. The textbooks I've put together will be available next year. They're just getting translated into the Chinese language as the first integrated midwifery textbooks for China. There is a, a prenatal quick reference manual and my other books are available at www.wordfp. Oh, thank you so much, Irene. I know that um, you've just got, you have a bottomless, bottomless part of information and knowledge and experience and it all comes out of the trenches of actually um, integrating holistic care with medical care. And um, it's funny because I, I know that you'll all probably be feeling like um, that was a really um, a little skim over the surface and it is <laughs> it's only a short part. It, it is. <laughs> you know, cause I, I know that uh, Irene and I can spend just hours nonstop, you know, getting deeply into a particular topic. Um, myself, as a, when I was a uh, uh, research midwife with Auckland University, one of the things that really drove home more than ever before, I think, is that whole realization that the more science learns about 
the pregnant woman's body, the more it realizes it doesn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because it does things and you're like why does it do that why yeah. why does that happen and then that does that you know so um we certainly the the idea that we know it all or the idea that our woman out there perceive that we know it all and our doctors know it all by now <laughs> yeah no <laughs> Not at all. Um, but, you know, it's uh, hopefully by the time our daughters have daughters and the idea of having, or before that, the idea of integrating care will just become absolutely routine, you know. So yeah. it will be like a, a you know, a dark moment mm -hmm. that, of course, if you've got gestational diabetes, you should yeah. be going and yeah. seeing your medical herbalist. Yeah. And of course, you should be seeing your acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. We know it improves us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, in, in China, Kathy, the, the, the government have put legislation so all the children are being taught Chinese medicine in, the, in their schools. Gosh, wow. So That's you can imagine the future of their healthcare system. I would only dream that our education in our countries would look at teaching children how to self-care, not just what yes. broccoli is, but what it does to your body, yes. you know, to integrate that as, as future growth. And I would like to see, well, I actually put together a new curriculum for midwifery training. I've got a draft copy of it already done that Jenny has in China, and I've already sent it to Roa. If Roa is listening in the Middle East, I've sent it over there for them to, to have a look at because it is the way to go. We yeah. can't continue. Our health systems cannot keep paying for C-sections and the complications. And we're a welfare country. And, you know, England is too. And it's our governments and our taxpayers will not be able to sustain it in the future. Yeah, and it's crazy because so much is preventable. Yeah. I found it very interesting uh, where you made your comment that um oh there's so many interesting things but particularly it resonated when you ma made the comment about having uh, out of a thousand odd clients here as a 24 uh, 7 on call self-employed midwife in new zealand um that you had about one in a thousand who experienced postnatal depression and i and your your practice and my practice are very, uh, you know have a lot of similarities um and uh I agree, you know, like the, the postnatal depression rate was incredibly low because everything else went so well, you know. So if, if you've had a, a lovely pregnancy and an empowering birth and a baby who's feeding like a trooper and every, why are you going to get depressed and not? That's right. We're absolutely thrilled. Yeah. Now, um, before we wind up, um, do throw in your questions if you've got yeah. um, any coming through and uh, we'll make sure that we get those answered. Okay. And I just want to look just a little just, check here. Just the homeopathic um, course. I just want to tell them about the homeopathic course. Can yes, you? yes, please do. I want to get yeah. to that. Absolutely. Okay. So um, for those of you that don't realize, um, Irene has uh, is involved with a um, accredited uh, homeopathic midwifery training course based out of New York. But just before that, I just want to show you something. Um, I know that Irene's been working on the most amazing uh, midwifery textbooks of integrative care that I've ever seen. I don't think, now, if there's one person on this planet that knows about books written on integrated care, I can put my hand on my heart and say it's me, because um, that's my baby, is, is that area, and I have never seen anything this good. These are absolutely the most amazing textbooks. And um, and I just, I, it blows my mind the amount of work that would have gone into those, and these are getting published. Um, but to put it into perspective, there's five books that she's been um, completing. And uh, so there's the antenatal pregnancy, postpartum, the labor and birth, um, and newborn, newborn care and, and breastfeeding. But here's the thing I want to show you guys. I had to have a look through our, our sh bookshelves here, and I want to show you this. This book is not a textbook on midwifery, <laughs> but this is a representation of the size of the books. 
this is what they are. There's five of them and they're this big. And uh, amazing, amazing, amazing information. And uh, also, uh, Irene's, we will, um, tomorrow everybody will receive an email which will give you a um, details about uh, a wonderful free guide that uh, Irene's very generously making available. Um, okay, I thank you, Irene. Tres interestant. <laughs> I think that must mean very interesting. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've just read the question here. Okay, but look, I want to. I know that you've got some stuff that you want to finish off with, um, Irene. So let me hand it back to you. Okay. I just want to tell you all that I was very privileged two years ago to fly to New York and meet Alistair and Denise at the, it's A-H-E-N-Y, so it's the Academy of Homeopathic Education, New York. And I put the whole uh, homeopathic course online for childbirth professionals. Uh, and it's just received accreditation from the U.S educational board. Now I'm very proud of this because it's got a whole midwifery holistic mindset so it's got the background it's got the background of um, of midwifery mindsets because it's not just giving a homeopathic remedy it's actually putting the whole picture together and there were well, actually so might many. um go a little way towards answering a question that's come in that we haven't quite got to yet do you have any recommendations on some readings alongside your own your own irene yes. um, for prevention of depression and anxiety in pregnancy and postpartum well what i've got for you on that handout i've put combination remedies together for the homeopathic course, I think it's easier for midwives who are not trained as homeopaths to use the combinations. So there's a whole list in that handout that will, you know, some women have different perceptions and different fears, so you can't just fix one type of anxiety. Yeah, right. fear of the motherhood would be one, uh, you know, fear of uh, socializing with other mothers yeah fear of not connecting with the baby so they're all in there under combinations on that handout so right, to make it right, easier right. for them yeah so um you'll all receive tomorrow an email that will um direct you on being able to request that and uh, i just see a little comment there from angela saying that she's already um, got Irene's advanced innovative prenatal care manual for midwives. That was the first one that you that brought out. That one. is actually published. You can actually go and buy that one now. And uh, I love what she says. It goes everywhere with me! Exclamation mark! Yeah, it's just amazing, amazing, amazing guides. And yeah. uh, I would go so far as to say that um, these are absolutely the best maternity guides on homeopathy um, that I've ever seen. And I don't think there's anybody even mm. vaguely yeah. close to <laughs> the that, literature that you've yeah. put together, Irene. And You're just an in, amazing, amazing yeah. In the uh, new books, you've got, you've got all of it. You've got homeopathy, you've got Chinese medicine, you've got essential oils, you've got massage techniques. I've put it all in it's there true. and in the They're research behind it. It's not just homeopathy. It no, is, it's, it's not. Made it here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um, so look, we, we will wind everything up now. Is there anything else that you want to add, Irene, before we conclude? Well, I would like to pray that everybody out there has a, I've opened mindsets that uh, we are, start, you know, to look out of the box and really, really put women and families first because no woman should be traumatized after birth. Oh, here, here. Um, yeah, so with you there. Look, thank you everybody for coming today. And, uh, you know, because if, if we don't have an audience, then there's not a lot of point and we appreciate uh, you're taking the time to watch and we appreciate the fact that we're kind of speaking to the converted here um, All of you guys out there are just fantastic that you know, you're you're We're all heading down that same integrative path 
and uh, it's a very exciting journey. And thank you, thank you, Irene. And uh, congratulations to have managed to, uh, to to get back to to New Zealand because that was not an easy <laughs> journey, which is another whole conversation. And, no, I've got uh, plenty so of these. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we'll just add our COVID bit in. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Thank you Take so care. much. Take I wish care. you all a great week. Bye. Bye.